Welcome back. Uh, I do apologize. Uh, they have reminded me of my mistake this morning because there was some echo in the mics there which rattled me a bit. So they said that I need to speak a bit closer to the mic. Is it working now? Thank you. So the way we have organized this uh, conference is that we are slowly but surely reaching towards the goal. So in the beginning there was those celebratory remarks and now we will get to see and hear the high level strategic vision and the progress from the industry and the actors in the value chain. So they are going to give us quite a big overview on how the steel industry is going to make that decarbonization path forward. After this one, we will get to the real juicy bit, which will be after lunch, going to the real technical bits, where you get to hear the details of those progress that we are making there. So we have got uh, quite a few distinguished presenters in this session. I would first like to call Dr. Sidon Chu. He is the Senior Executive Vice President at POSCO. Mr. Chu has been the Senior Executive Vice President of POSCO since 2022, and he's currently the Head of Technical Research Lab. He has got a distinguished career behind him. I would struggle if I go through everything that uh, he has achieved there. He has received quite a number of internal as well as external awards from several ministries. So please uh, welcome Mr. Chu. Thank you, Dr. Rizwan. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Sedonju uh, from POSCO Technical Research Laboratories. It is my pleasure to share POSCO's carbon neutral, neutral journey with all of you today. This image on screen is the view of Pohang Steelworks from Songdo Canal. It is our wish that steelworks and green nature can continuously coexist in harmony. Today, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the carbon neutral strategy of POSCO, low carbon and carbon free iron making processes, eco friendly product and then I'll conclude my talk. I'll start from the carbon neutral strategy of POSCO. Yeah. POSCO declared 2050 carbon neutrality to lead ESG trend in December 2020. We are planning to establish a sustainable system for a low carbon steel production. Many countries around the world have declared carbon neutrality by 2050 and putting on effort to accelerate decreasing carbon emission by 2030. Moreover, investors and customers are directly requesting us to supply low carbon steel product. Now, climate change became a key dimension of ESG considerations for business. We believe that a company must grow in harmony with a society to be sustainable. In 2020, POSCO made a commitment to carbon neutrality by 2050, a first amongst ASEAN steelmakers. The first roadmap was established 
in 2021, a scenario was made to achieve the target of a 10% reduction according to NDC by 2030. You see with gradual transition to carbon neutrality by 2050. In 2022, the roading roadmap was revised in order to include detailed measures to achieve NDC and to fulfill the low carbon steel demand, along with two routes of carbon neutral steelmaking through HIREX and EAF. In 2023, this year, it was revised further as the decarbonization speed has increased, the emission reduction target was elevated to reach 30% in consideration of strengthening bridge technology and commercialization of Hydex by 2035. This, this latest version strategy was announced by POSCO Group CEO, Mr. Choi jong woo present here at the Global Steel Dynamic Forum in June. This slide explains the current POSCO roadmap more in detail. By 2035, in addition to the CO2 reduction in conventional BF, BOF route, EAF and HIDEX will be introduced to POSCO steel works and start replacing the blast furnaces. By 2050, net zero will be achieved because on the three major routes, the first route is HIDEX, the second is one is EAF with HBI and scrap as the major iron source. The third is low carbon VF Finex in combination with CCUS. Along with the process development, the associated business will be developed, such as economical energy supply and massive hydrogen supply. Now, I'll talk about low carbon and carbon free iron making process. POSCO is developing bridge technology that can reduce CO2 emission in currently operated blast furnace. It is summarized as using more pellet for high redux reductibility and low gain content. Charging reduced ions such as like uh, HBI, injecting hydrogen containing gases, replacing carbon sources, and maximizing the operation efficiency in incorporating AI-based operation technology. This will promote the overall efficiency of, of blast furnace operation leading to the CO2 reduction. To improve the efficiency of basic oxygen furnace, oxygen top and bottom blowing converter is under development. While improved post-combustion reaction by 15 to 25 percent, the hot metal ratio can be decreased by 10 percent by charging more scrap. We will introduce electric arc furnace by 2026 20, at Guangyang Steelworks. In addition to the conventional steelmaking route, two paths are considered for the EAF. One is, one is mixing EAF molten steel with hard metal from blast furnace. The other path is directly transferring it to the secondary refining process. We are going to alternate the production route by customer's demand on carbon footprint and steel product quality. POSCO intend to apply CCUS technology to blast furnace and Finex. The priority is given to Finex because the discharge flue gas concentration of CO2 is over 70%. This is due to the pure oxygen use, 
and the CO2 PSA has been already incorporated. POSCO is developing the CO2 reuse technology for coke oven and BOF operation. Additionally, the captured CO2 can also be used as a feedstock for the versatile chemical product. It can also be sequestrated into domestic or overseas storage. This diagram shows the process flow of Hydex. Fine iron ore is directly charged into multi-staged fluidized bed reactors and reduced by heated hydrogen. The reduction ion is then transferred to the electric smelting furnace for melting. ESF enables high iron yield and recyclable slag. The quality of hot metal and slag is similar to the blast furnace. The hot metal is supplied to conventional steel making process. This enables to use existing steel making facilities and allows no restriction on high-grade steel manufacturing. It will be a distinguished strong point uh, compared to the EAF steel making. This is a roadmap of Hydex development. Hydex demo plant engineering is on the way. Lab tests have confirmed that hydrogen reduction is possible using a fluidized reduction furnace, and an ESF pilot plant is under construction. The engineering of Hydex demo plant, which a capacity of 300,000 per year, will be completed in 2026 and ready for test operations. The next step will be converting the Finex unit into the Hydex commercial facilities by 2030. Detailed information on the development of the Hydex process will be shared tomorrow in the morning session. This video clip shows some of the results obtained from the Hydex demo plant engineering. The 3D view shows the overall plane layout and the arrangement of key facilities like fluidized bed reactors and ESF. This complicated slide it indicates the future loop of POSCO's carbon neutral steelworks. Hydex will be producing high grade premium steel with thin top feet. Blast furnaces would still handle a certain portion of hot metal production. Another route would be EAF with abroad HBI and scrap. Hydrogen will be sourced domestically and overseas. Carbon-free electric power will be supplied by the, the external grid or in house power plant. The process will be optimized considering CO2 emission intensity, product mix, and economics. Next is eco-friendly product. We launched the carbon neutral master brand Greenit last year. The meaning of Greenit is make the planet green. Greenit consists of three sub brands. First, Greenit steel, which is low carbon steel product. Second, Greenit tech and process, which is our innovative technology such as Hyrex. And third, Greenit infra, which is infrastructure for realization of steel product, technology, and processes. The major customers such as IT, automobile, and energy industries demand low carbon product. In order to fulfill the demand, POSCO will establish a low carbon steel production and supply system. 
POSCO will increase, increase scrap ratio, reduction of carbon footprint, and invest in two electric arc furnaces by 2030. In addition to that, we will invest the renewable energy and plan to secure 7 million ton of hydrogen by 2050. POSCO will continue to uh, challenge new market by creating eco-friendly product. It is the uh, seven, seven major industry for uh, represented product. Uh, okay, I want to omit this page. There are our eco-friendly steel product, e-autopus for eco-friendly car application, Innovilt for premium structural steel, and Greenable for eco-friendly energy applications. With these three main brands, POSCO plans to expand the sale volume of steel for constructing on eco-friendly cities. The goal is to increase the sales volume from 6.4 million, million ton to 12 million ton by 2030 for eco-friendly product. Now, next conclusion. I'll conclude, conclude my talk with three main messages. Uh, first, POSCO will continuously develop business and technolo technological strategies to keep carbon neutrality by 2050. Second, POSCO will continuously develop carbon-free steelmaking processes and create a robust raw materials and energy supply chain. To meet demand, we will supply 10 million tons of low carbon intensity steel by 23. Lastly, carbon neutral master plan, Greenit, will lead the direction of carbon neutrality by POSCO. Based on this, POSCO will play a key role in steel industry still in the future by supplying high-grade steel to the eco-friendly industry utilizing carbon-free steel as a core material. Yeah, it is the last slide. The image is the Korea's first and largest, largest experimental sculpture called Space War. It was planned, product, produced and installed by POSCO to as a gift to Puang citizens. This place, this place became a must visit attraction in Korea. It was made only by various kinds of steel. If you have a chance to visit Pohang, please make sure to give yourself time to visit space work. Thank you very much for your attention. The way we have organized uh, this session is that we will have uh, 20 minutes of presentation from each presenter. So thank you very much for sticking with the time. I would have liked to give you a little token of appreciation, but I was a bit too late. But uh, we'll do that at the end. I'm going to call you up on the stage again. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Alexander Fleischhandel. He is Senior Vice President, Global Head of Green Steel at uh, Prime Metals Technologies. Again, uh, Dr. Fleischhandel has got a distinguished career with the Prime Metals. He has joined a long time back. And I would like to highlight that he holds over 100 single patents on his name. And he has been honored the Siemens Inventor of the Year 2013 and he received the Best Innovation Award from Mitsubishi Highway Industry in 2019. So everybody is looking forward to your presentation. Doctor, 
please. Yeah, thanks, uh, Richman, for, for the kind, kind introduction, and uh, thanks for, for having me here. Um, very warm welcome this uh, morning, also from my end. And uh, I'm go going to talk about uh, green steel in, in motion. And uh, uh, it was quite a nice uh, presentation we saw from uh, Bosco, and uh, also helps me a bit saving, saving time on a, on a couple of uh, topics here now. Um, well, I'd like to, to start a bit with uh, the challenges uh, we, uh, we, uh, we are uh, heading. Uh, so the first thing is, uh, it's really um, a make or break uh, decade. So still we are running 70% of the world steel production on coal, um, so with blast uh, furnaces, and the major decision to be made is now, well, either to go into another campaign and uh, refurbishment for the blast furnace, and that will lock in CO2 for another 15 uh, years, or go straight into a decarbonized uh, route via direct uh, reduction and uh, electric arc um, uh, furnace. So that's uh, uh, one major decision steel make, integrated steel makers um, um, have, to, have to make. And well, um, you will see that uh, um, slide uh, also uh, present, uh, represented at our booth out there. So I'll invite everyone uh, to join us at the booth. But we clearly see uh, the decarbonization is a three-phase uh, approach. While we are doing for many years now the optimization of uh, the steelmaking routes to achieve the best in decarbonization, uh, well, we have entered into the transition phase. Um, and we will hear a lot, I guess, today and also tomorrow about projects uh, um, in electrification, putting new blast furnaces in operation, new DRI uh, projects, and electrification of, uh, of processes. And finally, as also just said by, by Bosco, many commitments have been made within the World Steel um, Association members to achieve carbon neutrality, either by 2050 and some a bit, uh, bit later. And that will require a significant amount of renewable energy and, and hydrogen, and I'm coming back to that. Well, I've mentioned basically there are three pathways only. Uh, so steel will always require a certain amount of carbon, no doubt. Uh, that's uh, simply uh, required for the properties of steel. But the easiest way to decarbonize is electrification. Let's do electrification as much as possible. However, it cannot be achieved just by electrification. So we require alternative pathways and uh, one really or truly viable option is a decarbonized uh, hydrogen. Replace uh, fossil fuel by, by hydrogen. And last but not least, the remaining part, there will always be remaining CO2 stream from uh, the processes can be captured. Carbon capture, uh, storage and sequestration, and we will hear also about that um, uh, tomorrow in a, in, a, in a presentation. Well, that's uh, the challenge that is ahead. So I, I, I like this uh, slide because it, it's really showing how significant the challenge is for, uh, for the steel producers in the, in, in the world. And it's not the growth rate. So the growth rate is not significantly. So according to our models, we just expect 0.5% growth rate uh, till 2050. But the challenge is simply that we have to change the pathway, how we produce steel. And this reflects 850 million ton of steel that requires new pathways. And that's significant and a tremendous investment and also technological risk at the end. So according to our um, forecast, we see about one third of the steel production in 2050 covered by scrap-based EAF, one third by uh, direct reduction plus EAF, and one third remaining on the traditional blast furnace and um, BOF route. Well, um, according our green steel tracker, we see now uh, about 100 green steel projects that have been announced. Not all of them are in execution. 
Actually, it's just a small share. A bit more than 10 projects uh, um, have been awarded and are in the execution phase, uh, but 100 have been announced. And uh, the large, uh, there's a large number, 37 DRI modules have been announced and 63 electric arc furnaces. And the astonishing thing is just to focus on one region on, on, on Europe. The largest number of this green steel project is reflected in Europe. The pressure is high on still on the green deal to decarbonize coming with the ETS. So this comes with a lot of cost. Uh, however, energy cost and are remaining high in Europe. So that's a big um, challenge. So, well, staying a bit on DRI, um, there have not been many DRI modules in the, uh, in the historic track. Uh, up to the year of 2005, it has just been around one DRI module per year in, 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 in average. So it's not many. While then um, uh, following, uh, we end up, and this includes already the forecast till 2030, um, of around uh, three and a half, 3.8 DRI um, uh, modules per, per year. And uh, if we believe in the, in the forecast of many reports, this is going to increase to around uh, five to six DRI modules over the next five decades. So that's a significant number of new DRI capacity coming on stream. Well, uh, talking a bit about the feedstock restrictions, and uh, that's uh, also the, um, the motto of uh, this, uh, this presentation. And I start with uh, scrap. Well, I used here the World Steel Association scrap forecast uh, uh, model, which uh, goes very close to, to our own um, um, uh, model. It's the curve um, at the bottom. And you see, the good thing is that we will see a significant increase in, in the availability of scrap till 2050 uh, of around um, 500 million ton, uh, while the crude steel capacity is just going to increase likely by 250 million tons. So this will require less capacity from iron ore based virgin material. And uh, the, the best way is always to recycle um, steel at the end of the, uh, of the life cycle. But we have to wait for this end of the life cycle uh, for usually more than 40 years if we make a, a weighted uh, average. This slide I took from a recent presentation of the World Steel Dynamics uh, Forum. It's quite interesting because uh, on the left side you see uh, the forecast in 2030 on how the usage of scrap and, and iron ore is, is, is going to develop. And uh, it's logical that uh, with the new EAFs, we require more scrap in the, in the electric arc furnaces. It's significantly more scrap. And there will be a kind of war for, for this uh, scrap availability and uh, just uh, using the word of uh, um, protectionism for, for, for scrap. So that's really going to start now in all the regions in the, in the world. Uh, and we heard also, uh, just from the Bosco presentation, BUF have an opportunity to increase the scrap rate, and that's starting now also in China uh, with KBM combined blowing and the converters going up to scrap rates, uh, starting before of 8%, uh, but intending to go to 20 to 30% scrap rate in the, in the BUF with the combined uh, blowing with higher post combustion. And on the right side, you see another um, impact, and that leads me then to the iron ore as a feedstock. We will have a significant impact on the availability of lower grade iron ores because uh, China is going to blow down a large number of, uh, of blast furnaces. And uh, so we remain with these blast furnace pellets in the market and the lower and medium grade uh, iron ores. And if you, you look at the, the, the column on, on China, it's more than 300 million tons that it is expected on uh, um, uh, not used um, BF pellets and uh, uh, Sinterfeed in, in China. So, well, that's the uh, seaborne uh, iron ore uh, trade uh, diagram. 
And um, well, we have iron ores uh, of quality less than 50%, it's minor share, but on the other hand, also the highest quality that is usually used for DRI production is just a minor share. So it's uh, only 4% of iron ore that is above uh, 66% or 66.5% of, of, of iron. And all the other iron ores are somewhere in between the 60 to 65 um, percent. Well, on the bottom part, you see actually the, the roots and that's uh, bringing me then the, to the technology pathways and uh, also the strategy of uh, prime metals technology where we put all our efforts in the development uh, uh, process. And uh, you see three technologies in direct reduction. One is the shaft-based technology, uh, mid-rex technology, where we're uh, uh, in a close partnership with uh, Midrex, and you will hear about the Midrex process uh, tomorrow. And uh, the other one is Hyrex. You just heard, and we will hear another uh, deep dive presentation by Dr. Shin uh, tomorrow, where we partner up with, uh, with POSCO uh, again. And the third pathway is on, on high rex, uh, sorry, on high four uh, fine oil reduction. And all these three technologies can deal with, um, um, with different quality of uh, iron ore and can run on hydrogen. That's also uh, important um, to say about. Well, moving from iron ore to, to energy, and that's the biggest roadblock. Uh, iron ore and scrap are roadblocks, but they are minor compared to the energy availability and the energy cost uh, issue. And uh, I love this, um, this diagram, even if it's a bit outdated, more than one year old, but it's, um, it's showing the energy cost on the vertical axis, it's the natural gas price, and on the horizontal axis, it's the electric power price in the different um, countries around the, the world. And um, uh, I would consider just the countries in the blue block uh, down there is the low energy uh, cost countries. And why this is uh, so important is because the upstream iron making is highly energy intensive. Uh, therefore, it's quite logic that uh, all the countries having access to low energy prices have a significant advantage over the other uh, countries. And I'm coming back to, uh, to this point in, in, in a minute. And that's another um, interesting diagram from uh, Frost and Sullivan um, taken. And uh, that's on the vertical axis, the hydrogen production capacity, while on the horizontal one on the left is the demand side of hydrogen. And the quarter up uh, to the left are the countries that likely will uh, be able to export low-priced hydrogen uh, to other countries. So that's, uh, that's significant, um, uh, of significant importance. And on the right-hand side, the expected hydrogen cost from renewable energy in the year of 2040. And you see, well, the red and orange colored um, regions have the potential for 2040 to produce hydrogen between two and three US dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. And that's required. Another slide I took from the World Steel Dynamics uh, Forum. Uh, on the left, you see the, the, uh, the, the baseline um, um, in um, um, blast furnace feed into the electric arc furnace, the remaining part in scrap. And that's the baseline cost to produce steel. And all the other technology routes are more expensive. The blue colored uh, version is assuming that we can achieve hydrogen at the cost of two US dollars, while the green one is uh, saying five US dollars. And if you go to the right uh, uh, columns, this is uh, DRI-based production on a high share of uh, hydrogen and you see on the, on, the, on the green side, if we do that at five US dollars per kilogram, we are far away from any competitiveness in the, in the market. So at the end, we have to achieve a cost range close to two US dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. 
Let me revert now back to the um, technology strategy. And it's a, a bit a busy uh, slide, but uh, again, it's uh, summarizing the three technology paths with via direct uh, reduction routes on a high four, uh, high rex, and the mid rex uh, process. And so, well, you might uh, question why three different uh, direct reduction technologies are required simply because of the different iron ore feedstock. While Hyrex is uh, dedicated, and you will hear this tomorrow from Dr. Shin, on Sinterfeed uh, up to eight millimeter, so typical Sinterfeed hematite iron ore, high four. Uh, feeds uh, ultra-fine and fine iron ore uh, of any quality, hematite, goethite, uh, magnetite, and uh, likely it's the only technology that can utilize any type of iron ore in the market, high grade, low grade as well. Well, and Mitrex, I guess, is well, well known, requires uh, pellet, uh, pellet feed um, to, to reduce. And then, you see in the middle, uh, that's the low to medium grade iron ores. And as this comes with a lot of uh, gang, uh, you cannot go straight into an electric arc furnace. It's about the smelter uh, then um, to separate the slag, the, uh, the high amount of slag um, from, uh, from the DRI before you can go into the BOF. And that's a route that might be applicable uh, for many of the integrated steel makers because they can remain with all the downstream assets uh, further on, starting with the BOF and secondary metallurgy. While on the high-grade iron ore side, more to the right, well, you produce typical high-quality DRI, HBI, and can feed the EIF uh, uh, directly there. Well, the, the um, issue is, um, that uh, for today, if we look on the technology roadmap, we have only shaft-based technology that is well established. Uh, that's commercially available on natural gas, and it's well proven now also running on, on, uh, on hydrogen. And we have the electric arc furnace that is well, well proven, even with 100% DRI feed and hot link. Um, but all the other technologies are in a quite advanced development stage, but still not commercially proven. And this final de-risking now requires quite a significant uh, capital investment and, and risk, uh, risk taking that is ongoing for Hyrex. You have uh, just uh, heard it uh, from my predecessor um, speaker. So talking therefore a bit on high four. Um, development, um, and uh, this um, is quite a long journey. So we started in 2005 on the high for development on a small scale in the, in the lab with uh, small reactors, and ended up uh, two years back now in this pilot plant you see um, uh, on, on the picture here. On the very left, it, that's the fluidized bed uh, reactor, working on 100% hydrogen, producing um, a green um, DRI. Um, it's located at uh, the premises of uh, First Alpine in, uh, in Donowitz, uh, there. Quite a good uh, uh, cooperation with, uh, with First Alpine on, on uh, this one. And the scale is, it's a batch operation, one ton of iron ore feed. Um, well, we have run with, um, uh, I would say, almost all the iron ore qualities from around the world. Uh, 50 campaigns with different iron ores and um, uh, very successful. Uh, to say, so producing around 600 kilogram of um, highly metallized um, DRI. So as this uh, was uh, quite successful so far, uh, we're on the way to make the investment decision for the next stage, and that's an industrial prototype. And the project is called High for Smelt, if you cross ways on, uh, on that one. Um, in a cooperation, and you see the cooperation partners on the right top. Again, first, uh, Alpine, but this time intended in the location uh, first Alpine Linz, and the other uh, partner there is uh, Fortescue, the uh, Australian major mining uh, company. So we intend a groundbreaking early next uh, year on this project, and includes everything from the iron ore 
um, grinding, drying, um, and uh, so we can really feed every iron ore. The scale is three ton per hour continuous operation. Uh, and we are going finally not only to DRI, we have also the opportunity to produce HPI, so we have a bricketing press there, and uh, feeding a, a, a smelter as well. So uh, we, we can go down to green um, um, hot metal or, or pig, uh, pig iron um, down there, also feed some shredded uh, scrap in there. And a focus will also be on the utilization of this leg and working closely with the cement industry. That's a 3D um, uh, model of uh, this uh, plant already well integrated into the, the plant. So the height of uh, the, the plant is uh, about 35 uh, uh, meter. And that's the smelter. We also made quite a progress in the last 12 months on the uh, development work of uh, large scale uh, smelter uh, technology. Um, you've seen it also from the Bosco presentation. We work with uh, rectangular-based um, uh, smelter technology on six, uh, six electrodes. The capacity of one smelter is up to 1.3, 1.4 million ton of hot metal that can be produced. Well, here you see the timeline for both uh, high 4 and high rex uh, you have seen. It's uh, pretty in, much in parallel, the timeline on the development, and then entering in the, uh, into the commercial phase uh, with uh, the technologies. And that um, brings me already uh, to, the, to the conclusion uh, of the presentation. I uh, already announced that we'll talk a bit about the protectionism. And uh, for sure, there are certain elements now. Everyone is key to key, uh, keen to keep the scrap in the, in the country and utilize this as a secondary feedstock uh, for melting. So we have seen in the last um, 12 to 24 months a lot of uh, backward integrations from major steel makers, um, acquiring scrap um, processing companies. And uh, Iron uh, scrap availability and scrap quality will become really a major issue. How to prepare scrap, to clean scrap, um, to produce high-end uh, steel even on high scrap uh, share in the feedstock. Second one I mentioned is there will be a strong undersupply of high-quality DR-grade iron ore. Therefore, it's likely that we have to deal with lower-grade iron ores with the direct reduction technologies together with the hydrogen. And um, the most important part, again, is the limit on the energy part. So we have heard now over the past months, uh, really, uh, voices even from governments in, in Europe that they put the question mark if it uh, might happen that there will be a decoupling of iron making and steel making, even in Germany uh, over the last few weeks. Um, and thinking about, uh, does it make sense to, to remain with the iron making step in, in Europe or do it elsewhere where energy is cheaper? Green steel premium, uh, last point on that one. It's important. The market is ready, obviously, to pay significant uh, premium on, on the green steel. And that's required, anyhow, um, to make it competitive uh, to the other steel making routes. And that's uh, my last slide here. And uh, that's just stressing how important partnerships and corporations are. The journey is complex. The journey is uh, uh, really uh, massive uh, that we have uh, to do. So we can't just stem it in, in close partnerships, sharing technology risks, investment costs, and to proceed ahead. And just a few uh, announcements, and you will hear about most of these things in the coming two days. High for smell that just announced. The South Coast, we are heavily engaged uh, in Salzgit in Germany on a high capacity electric arc furnace uh, on um, green DRI, uh, hot DRI charging. Gravity, uh, you're invited again to uh, visit our booth. There's uh, Jose Noldin sitting here also and um, jointly at our, at our booth. It's uh, the first uh, green DRI plant intended in the south of France in Fosse-sur-Mer. 
And um, the, the other one is uh, we are just on the way to start up with, uh, on the ArcelorMittal premises in, in Belgium, a carbon capture plant. Uh, you see the containers um, uh, are on the way there. Uh, it's uh, for carbon capture at one of the blast furnaces there. Hyrex, you've heard. Still a no. Uh, we have also ArcelorMittal here and in a discussion tomorrow, but um, just announced first production of ethanol from the waste gases from blast furnace on really um, in um, very important um, te uh, technological route with Lancetec, and we have also Lancetec here, and that's another important partnership on CCU, on biofermentation. And last but not least, on the very right, active power feeder. It's a major development work we are doing uh, to secure when you power electric arc furnaces and they are hungry with renewable energy, uh, to avoid any backfiring to the grid on the medium voltage line um, with, uh, with this uh, technology. And we are on the way the first installation in Germany at a 50 ton electric arc furnace. So thank you for your kind attention and um, being available at the, at the booth for, for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fleischhandel. Uh, it is really important that you highlight that these kind of changes are going to have a profound effect on the steel industry, how it operates. Because right now, the paradigm is that we find the very concentrated form of energy, which is coal. You can purchase it, the supply chains are well established, but if you want to replace it with something different, which is not available. You cannot purchase energy like coal in a concentrated form and store it indefinitely on site. So if you have to replace it with something else, let's say hydrogen or green electricity, you cannot store it like that. So it will have an impact on how the steel industry is going to, to reshape in the next 10, 20, 30 years. So we have exactly uh, that topic being addressed in one of the panel discussions, which will be tomorrow. So that will be the pinnacle of that that whole debate. There is one today. Yeah, the other one is, is, is tomorrow there. So these are very key uh, discussions there. I would really like to, to invite you to pay full attention on those because it will be a fantastic debate there. Uh, without uh, further ado, I would now invite uh, the next presenter, Dr. Fernando Actis. He is the Vice President, Global Research and Development at Ternium. He holds PhD in Materials Engineering and is responsible for decarbonization research roadmap at Ternium in cooperation with research teams of Tenova, Teket Pro, and uh, Tenaris. Please. Thank you, Rizman. Nice to be this morning with this audience and talking about those topics that interest of both of all of us. Um, my presentation will be about Ternium's roadmap for decarbonization. Ternium operates in, in Latin America and we had set targets to reduce our CO2 emissions by 20% in 2030. Given uh, the operations we have in, in different countries that are characterized by diverse technologies, Ternium has been actively developing customized decarbonization plan tailored to the unique circumstances of each location. This presentation will try to provide a comprehensive overview of Ternium multifaceted decarbonization initiatives aligned with long-term carbon neutrality pathways while considering local technological and market conditions. How, how does it okay, thank you. Just a brief description of what Ternium is. We belong uh, 
to the tech Int organization, which owns these companies that are listed in this slide. Later on, we will speak of some of them which are closely cooperating with us in our decarbonization path, like Tenova and Tech Petrol. Tech Petrol is the oil and gas company of the group, and Tenova is a very well known equipment manufacturer that will deliver a lecture next to mine. Ternium has a strong presence in the three Americas we, with sales of 16 billion, and main markets are Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina, where our main operations are also located. And um, we have production in our main uh, production, as I mentioned, is from south to north in Argentina and Brazil. In Argentina and Brazil, we operate blast furnaces. We have one active blast furnace in Argentina and two in Brazil. And by the other hand, in Mexico, we operate three direct reduction modules and we have announced the construction of a fourth one in the next years. Also, also we have EAF, 100% scrap production of steel in Mexico and Colombia. And as you may know, the, the matrices of these uh, countries are, are quite different. And we try to, we try to adjust our roadmap, our decarbonization roadmap to the fundamentals of each country. For example, in Argentina, we have a very relevant production of natural gas, which has increased sensibly, sensitively the last year through the shale gas operations startup, where Tech Petrol, one of the companies of the group, has, has been a pioneer in this uh, new way to produce natural gas. And we also have a very good opportunities for renewable and green energies like uh, solar power and, and wind farms. So we, we have to use these advantages of the country to uh, decarbonize our blast furnace operations. And we will come back to this in, in some minutes. In Brazil, we, we don't have a competitive natural gas supply by the moment, but it's well known for the availability of biomass and biofuels. So we have to look at that. And Mexico, in Mexico, we have a, also, as in Argentina, a good supply of natural gas from the United States, very close to us from Texas operations. And so this is a great advantage for our direct reduction operations. In, in Mexico also, we, we have carbon capture and use since about 30 years when, for our direct reduction units. And if we go to the iron ore supplies, we have differences also. In Argentina, we we tend to use the iron ore of the southern region of Brazil called Urucum. Then our Rio plant is mainly feed from Belo Horizonte. And in Mexico, we operate our own mines in the Coahuila region. All these uh, iron ores are quite different and offer different challenges and opportunities for our operations. In, I'm sorry, I have to, to go back with this one, okay. Um, one mentioned here, when I, I started uh, announcing that we will reduce 20% our emissions. So we will go to 1.35 tons 
of CO2 per crude steel ton in 2030. In 2022, our mix of iron production is 60, 63% is blast furnace, 29% is direct reduction, and 8% is EAF. Here. Sorry. This will change in 2030 and will be, blast furnace will be 52, direct reduction 42, and EAF 6%. And we'll reach a target of 135 tons of CO2 per ton of crude steel. Um, we, we are in our decarbonization 2030 Roadmap, we, we are using the advantages I have been mentioning that we have in our current operations. First of all, we will increase, increase efficiency in all our operations. We will increase the use of scrap in Brazil. We will use renewable energy, mainly in Argentina. We will also use uh, bio materials mainly in Brazil and will increase our carbon capture and use in Mexico. We will also, uh, we are cooperating with, with our sister companies like Tenova in the development of state-of-the-art direct reduction and carbon capture units and with Tech Petrol in very uh, brand new initiatives for the long-term roadmap. Uh, as I mentioned, in Argentina, we, we are building a wind farm operation that will supply 99 megawatts. Uh, it is, the wind farm is located in the Buenos Aires province, not far away from our main uh, operations where the blast furnace is, is and steel shop is, is located. Argentina has a very uh, advantage situation for wind energy with a uh, frequency of use that is unusual in the rest of, of the world because of the permanent winds that we have both in Buenos Aires and mainly in the Patagonia region that is started to be in the, developed. In Brazil, a quite different approach. We will uh, optimize our operation through smart production in our blast furnaces using artificial intelligence. We are, we are uh, conducting now a $29 million investment for in increasing the scrap usage. And we, we are developing tests with biomass in order to replace um, uh, mineral carbon as a reductant. In Mexico, we have started building a new direct reduction plant. It is designed to produce 2.6 million tons of slabs mainly for the automotive industry sector. The DRI plant will be 2.1 million tons and is planned to start operations in 2026 with an investment of 2.2 billion. For 2030, this facility will produce steel with 0.6 tons of CO2 uh, emitted for ton of crude steel. In, in Mexico, we have a, quite a good history of decarbonization that started many years ago. As I mentioned, we started capturing and using CO2 since three, dec 
three decades ago. So we have uh, an extensive knowledge on these, uh, these techniques. We are developing an extensive network of scrap supply. And uh, we are developing strategic partnerships with other players in the value chain, in the value chain to, in, to improve our decarbonization targets. The new facility will be located in our Pesqueria Industrial Center that is in northern part of Mexico, close to the Monterey city. And this is a state-of-the-art industrial center, mainly oriented to the high-end steels production. What, what for the future, uh, in our vision, the future roadmap uh, will have to deal with new, what we call new connecting technologies. So we, have, we will have new ways to feed our reduction processes with biomasses, with briquettes, with iron ore briquettes, with biofuels, with natural gas, with hydrogen. Also our direct reduction modules with medium and low grade iron ores and different fuels, and this has to be done with the intensive development of new technologies that will adapt our existing processes to the operation with this diverse matrix of uh, supplies. So we are intensively working to make this happen, to make these new materials, this new raw materials be useful for our decarbonization processes. And they cannot fit directly into our current operation if we don't develop what we mentioned as a new connecting technologies. Then if we look at the downstream, the, the same will happen. We have mentioned carbon capture uh, usage, and this has to be developed further where storage is under studies. And also we have to, maybe we have to change the way that we, we, we conduct the primary metallurgy in our steel shops, the way we melt and we refine our steel. So because we will have to include the uh, smelters in our processes and to understand how to obtain the similar grades to those with, we produce with big iron today, what will happen with the slag that we will be producing there and the, its use. And for the electric arc furnaces, the big challenge is how to develop the very high-end steels that we currently produce through the blast furnace, BOF, processing routes. We have to be able to develop very low nitrogen, very low carbon, very low sulfur, very low phosphorus grades in, a different, in different ways. So there is a huge challenge there for the metallurgy, for a new metallurgy to assess these needs of our processes. We come to the, finally to the conclusions. Um, Ternium's uh, carbon reduction strategy is optimized according to the fundamentals of each of the countries where we have our main operations. We have to get advantage of the long tradition of DRI operations that we have in Mexico, where we have been producing already high-end products with this road. Ternion is investing in, in very low emission technologies, like the one I mentioned is being built, it's going to be built, it's not now on the, on the design step, 
is going to be built in the next years in, in Monterey. And uh, ternium decarbonization new initiatives include uh, to optimize optimization of our existing process and also considering new and disruptive technologies. And Ternion has, is aware that we cannot do this alone, that we need to cooperate with technological leading partners in all our value chain with suppliers of iron ore, suppliers of different raw materials, of fuels, suppliers of equipment, and also with our customers that will be receiving the, the steels that we will produce in a new, in a new more green uh, way. Um, as my previous, the previous speakers mentioned, the, we need to cooperate. The, the challenge uh, we face is huge and we have to speed up the solutions that we are trying to implement. All of us are working individually, but perhaps we need to work more on pre-competitive issues together and horizontal, horizontal organizations like World Steel will, will help us to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Arcus. I completely share your view that the innovation does not and cannot happen in isolation. We have to speak with each other and then try to find the solution in a common way. And uh, with that note, I would like to invite our next speaker, Paolo Argenta. He is the Executive Vice President, Upstream Business Unit at Tenova. He has worked in several countries and holds a master's degree in mechanical engineering uh, from the University of Genoa in Italy. Paolo. Morning. Thank you. That's the picture when I got married, so it was a while ago. All right, so I need to, okay, I guess I go. Okay, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, some ideas uh, and approaches that Tenova has been developing, but likewise Tenova also our competitor are doing these kind of things. And I believe that's very interesting for the industry because we need solution. So first of all, just one quick point about sustainability that is very important for the group. Fernando has presented uh, Ternium. Ternium and Tenaris are two steelmaking company. They both care about sustainability. The group cares about sustainability. And uh, we also have, as Tenova, we have issued uh, uh, the first sustainability report this year, ahead of time compared to um, other European companies. Uh, just very quickly about our approach. Um, as I was saying, we, first of all, try to pursue a partner attitude. So we look for partners, whether it's a competitor, other players in the industry, customers. We like to develop things together. Usually it works better that way. We do have two types of impact that we can do. One is what we call direct impact. That is technologies and processes that can re help customers reduce the emission. We also have a quite uh, big business uh, in developing solutions to produce uh, material that are uh, required for decarbonization. For instance, recently we've been involved in building a um, system to recover uh, lithium, uh, cobalt, nickel from uh, used car batteries. Uh, we are uh, also playing quite uh, a lot on the rare earths, uh, uh, uranium. So we try also not only to go toward the decarbonization for the customer, but also to develop technologies to produce material that are needed for decarbonization. One thing that I'm going to stress today is also the fact that people need a flexible solution. Um, I'll quickly go through a presentation of the Energiron technology. Energiron is a technology that 
was developed by Ternium and then uh, Tenova and Danieli nowadays are the one further developing the technology and uh, putting the technology into the market. Um, uh, Fernando has mentioned uh, uh, just uh, in previous presentation the fact that now we are supplying also to Ternium again uh, uh, this technology. Um, the Energiaron technology is a hydrogen ready technology. Uh, you can go back and forth and that helps a lot nowadays because uh, in this period uh, of transition uh, it's quite important to have the possibility to use hydrogen when hydrogen is available or will be available but also to use natural gas in the moment in which hydrogen is too expensive or not available. Um, there are other characteristics like uh, we, we sequestrate CO2 that can be used and uh, we produce, uh, in case of natural gas, uh, high carbon. Definitely, there are different solutions out there. We believe that uh, uh, Energiron is a good technology, but what I want to focus on my presentation today is uh, what do you do with the RI? Because we speak a lot about the RI, and uh, I also believe Alexander has made some uh, um, presentation. I, I'm, I'm, Sorry that the, the format is not exactly what was meant to be, but I mean, that's the way it is. Um, so, one thing that is important is what you do when you have DRI. You can go the merchant solution. So, you can either ship called DRI or HBI, and that can go anywhere. It might even be uh, charged on a blast furnace. Um, but definitely, what is important is that that charge that is very good for electric arc furnaces. Or, as was mentioned before, you can produce uh, hot metal. So, I guess, oh, that's not the point. Um, you can produce hot metal, so pig iron. You can, uh, uh, have, you can produce pigs, or you can have a granulator. And pig iron can also be shipped, sent to other countries and used as a charge into the electric arc furnace. Then there is how you produce steel directly on site. So one route is the RI production, electric arc furnace, and you go directly to liquid steel. This is the very much standard type solution for the RI plant. Nowadays, many companies have introduced a possible different solution that is using the DRI from lower grade pellets to produce pig iron that kind of emulate the pig iron coming from the blast furnace. You see here that once you have hot metal on a torpedo car, you can either go to the BOF or you can charge hot metal into the electric arc furnace. Different solution for different needs. There is also another way uh, that was also mentioned uh, by POSCO, uh, that is uh, mixing uh, the melt from the electric arc furnace uh, with the pig iron of the blast, of the blast furnace. Uh, it's a very interesting technology because you can immediately increase the amount of uh, scrap uh, into the blast furnace production, and so you can immediately start decarbonizing the blast furnace operation. I'll go to the next. I'll come back to this later. This is, uh, as I mentioned, the classic solution. Uh, being a World Steel Association uh, event, uh, we're quite happy, and I, I met also HBIS people. Uh, this year we won, uh, together with HBIS, uh, the uh, World Steel Association Award for Excellence in Low Carbon Steel Production. This is for a project. Uh, in China, in which was Energiron, supplied Tenova and Danieli, and Electric Arc Furnace by Tenova. I go to the next. As I was mentioning before, a different type of blast furnace, so producing similar grade of pig iron, is the RI plant and OSBF. We call it OSBF, other people call it ESF, uh, Melter, whatever. Basically, it's the same technology that is uh, used for submerged dark furnace, or let me say similar technology, not completely the same, but very similar. 
This is uh, just for you to give you the, the, the feeling of the size. Uh, th this is uh, for a plant producing 2.5 million ton uh, DRI pellet. Uh, those uh, furnaces, uh, we prefer the round solution uh, three electrode. Those furnaces are 20 meter diameter. So when you talk about, uh, or when you think about uh, submerged dark furnaces, uh, you're always thinking about very big machine, not tilting, but they have their own challenges. So what we believe is that in general, the electric arc furnace importance will be growing in the coming year. You see, this is just recalling slides that I presented before. You see, there is an electric arc furnace on top, electric arc furnace down using pig iron, and uh, an electric arc furnace uh, preparing a melt uh, to be mixed uh, with uh, uh, tapping from uh, blast furnace. So, all electric arc furnace, uh, Tenova believes very much uh, into continuously fed electric arc furnace. Uh, we've, we've had a good result uh, by going that way and we still push for that solution, but there are others. So, so, in recent times, we have seen the size of the electric arc furnace growing very much. I mean, used to be electric arc, you know, big electric arc furnace, 150, 200 ton tapping size. You see here three examples. One is the Arvedi furnace, which is uh, with cone steel electromagnetic steering. 300 ton tapping size and a productivity of more than 400 ton of liquid steel per hour. But uh, we have had uh, recently, we signed two contracts that for us are important for POSCO in South Korea, 280 ton tapping size, and that's the furnace that is also ready to charge, uh, to prepare a melt that can be charged uh, with uh, um, the blast furnace tapping uh, pig iron. And uh, obviously, Ternium Pescheria, that is our sister company, that's 300 ton tapping size and 340 MVA uh, transformer. So, a lot of things are happening. Electric arc furnace is a world that is uh, changing quite quickly, given the request from the market. Uh, this is just very quickly how is going to work the system to melt. Uh, uh, to mix uh, hot metal and con steel and, and tapping from the electric arc furnace, which could be con steel. What we believe is important for this application, uh, obviously you need to keep the oxygen activity in the bath quite low, uh, little to non-oxygen uh, uh, injection. For this type of application, uh, besides continuous feeding, we also like very much the idea of having electromagnetic steering to keep the bath uh, rotating and avoiding, uh, let's say, carbon boiling reaction uh, and, uh, let's say, uh, situation that, are, uh, that, that would create problem for the operation. This is uh, the continuous feeding of pig iron into an electric arc furnace. We have several of these applications, especially in China. Also, our competitors are doing similar system. We see also this one as an opportunity to increase uh, or let's say to increase the amount of scrap that is used on blast furnace operation. So what we see today is that uh, it's not easy to be a steel maker because at the end of the day, the, the world is rapidly changing. You have to be ready for the future. You have to be ready for the challenges, but uh, there are not clear pathways uh, defined. So. It's not easy to be now in the position to have to decide uh, for investment that can be hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And we see that uh, there are not only the classical question uh, for the steelmakers. So, you know, availability, cost of raw material, cost of energy. There is also the unknown of uh, market and customer behavior that uh, can swing uh, very much uh, toward uh, uh, low carbon steel, or maybe there might be a moment in which they may go back uh, because price uh, is gonna always drive uh, the purchasing behavior of the customer. Uh, local regulations, regulations are changing quickly. Um, 
we see a lot of things uh, that will happen, and Fernando was mentioning that, uh, on, the, on the quality of the steel produced, because producing steel by electric arc furnace is not the same thing as producing steel by BOF. There will be the need of developing solution for secondary metallurgy. Um, another big point uh, is going to be the electrical network strength, uh, because uh, what electric arc, the size of the electric arc furnace used to be much smaller, and uh, the, um, the effect on the electrical network uh, was smaller. Nowadays, uh, people will find that this big electric arc furnace with huge transformer connected or converter type uh, machines connected, they do have a different impact on the electrical network. And that's something that has to be addressed uh, technically. There is also the, the issue of slag. Uh, people used with the, uh, to run electric arc furnace, they are used to a certain amount of slag. People running blast furnace operation, different type of slag, different amount of slag. There must be a solution also for the slag. Using DRI on electric arc furnace increase the amount of slag compared to an electric arc furnace. But if you go the electric arc furnace route, you cannot uh, sell the slag to the cement industry. While going for a smelter, you can sell still the slag to the cement industry. There are a big number of opportunities and threats for the steelmaker to take their decision. So, uh, what we believe is that the steelmaker need different solution need different alternative, and it's, uh, let's say, up to the supplier to come up with uh, ideas uh, and uh, discuss with our customer what could be the best for their solution, to, for their situation today, and how that situation is going to evolve in the coming year. Uh, there has been a lot of work done uh, on the market uh, for, the, for the technologies, uh, well done, uh, well done to our competitor, first of all. Also well done a little bit <laughs> to us. Uh, but we believe that that's good because the world is requiring changes. Uh, and uh, uh, we are strongly believing that uh, we cannot hit the market with one size fits all approach. So there is not like a silver bullet, uh, the solution for everybody. It's a work that we have to do every day with the customer to find the solution. So, thanks to the steelmaker for the willingness to, to try things, to develop things with us. Thanks to our competitor and to the company that uh, have joined us and our competitor to develop a solution for our industry. Thank you very much. So, with that, uh, we now reach the final presentation of this session. Dr. Hideki Murakami, he is Executive Advisor, Nippon Steel Corporation. <laughs> Dr. Murakami has got a master's degree in chemical engineering. Uh, from Osaka University and a PhD in mining and metallurgical engineering from McGill University in the US. So please. Thank you very much, Harsin. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Today, I would like to uh, talk with uh, this title uh, in the three positions. So, first of all, I would like to introduce the national project called GRAND. Now we are implementing. GRAND means uh, green innovation in the steel making. Uh, since 2008, Japanese steel industry uh, has been promoting the uh, development of uh, hydrogen reduction technology uh, brass furnace uh, under the course 50. And uh, we have verified uh, the, uh, the first, uh, for the first time in the world that it is possible to reduce the 
CO2 emission uh, 10% in the blast furnace by uh, hydrogen. And uh, 2021, based on the, uh, this result, uh, we started, uh, we started uh, uh, hydrogen utilization in the iron steel making process project. Uh, it's grains. This grains project is a part of the uh, Green Innovation Fund of the government. So now we are uh, promoting the multi truck uh, development, including blast furnace, direct reduction, and electric furnace. So, uh, grains project carried out by the uh, hydrogen uh, steel making consortium. Uh, this consortium is consists of the four partners uh, Nippon Steel, uh, JF Steel, uh, Kobe Steel, and JRCM. Also, uh, the consortium conducts joined the research with 13 uh, research institutes from uh, Hokkaido, Kyushu. So, as you are aware, uh, reducing CO2 emission in the steel industry uh, is a challenging task. So, this pie chart uh, shows the breakdown of the CO2 emissions by each country and by each sector in Japan uh, from energy. Uh, Japanese uh, emission from the Japanese steel industry accounts for 13.6% uh, uh, of the, all Japan's emissions. Uh, unfortunately, number one emission sector in Japan. Uh, this is the flow, but you know very well, so I skipped. Okay, this slide shows uh, breakdown of CO2 emissions during uh, steel, uh, steel making process. Approximately 80% of uh, CO2 emission uh, from the uh, steel works is due to the uh, iron making uh, process. So, to realize uh, uh, carbon neutrality, uh, this part is the most important point. Okay, in grains, uh, okay. in grain projects, we are, we are pursue, uh, pursuing the development uh, uh, double track, uh, both uh, blast furnace and uh, direct hydrogen reduction. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we use uh, uh, scrap as much as possible in both cases. So, as you know, uh, blast furnace oxygen converter process has uh, many strong points, uh, wide range of grade raw materials, and high productivity and high quality of the molten steel, also high energy efficiency. So, the only challenge is uh, CO2 emission. So, we uh, convinced that the blast furnace uh, uh, should be decarbonized at most, and used appropriately for the decades transitory. Of course, uh, if uh, green electricity and green uh, hydrogen are sufficient to secure the, uh, direct hydrogen reduction technology is a very strong tool to uh, carbon neutrality. The challenge is the use of the low-grade iron and uh, the production of the high quality of the molten steel. Okay, grain project consists of the uh, four main items. Uh, uh, hydrogen reduction, uh, blast furnace technology, utilizing the hydrogen from within the steel works. It's cost 50. The secondary, uh, ultramate, uh, low carbon blast furnace technology using external uh, hydrogen and blast furnace gas. The third way, uh, direct hydrogen reduction technology to the reduce low grade iron. And the fourth way, uh, technology to remove the impurity in the electric furnace using direct reduced iron. Uh, this slide shows uh, hydrogen uh, reduction technology in the blast furnace. So, uh, center figure shows a uh, cost 50. So we use uh, uh, 
hydrogen generated in the steel works are mainly coke oven gas uh, in order to replace the uh, carbon direct reduction with hydrogen reduction. Uh, CO2 uh, reduction target is 10% uh, uh, and the, at the same time uh, we develop the uh, new uh, CO2 absorber uh, for the CCS. Right here uh, shows the uh, development of technology to maximize the uh, amount of the hydrogen reduction in the blast furnace. Uh, we call it Super Cost 50. Uh, the carbon reduction target uh, in this system is uh, 50%. So in which case uh, we need heat is required uh, to compensate for the endothermic uh, absorption of hydrogen reduction. So uh, super cost 50 is a high temperature uh, hydrogen and uh, cost 50 is a normal temperature. Cost 50 uh, is in the almost the final stage. Uh, demonstration test will be conducted in the actual large blast furnace. Hydrogen containing gas injection facility will be introduced at the Kimitsu number two work uh, blast furnace of Nippon Steel. Uh, light photo uh, shows the number two blast furnace. Uh, productivity is uh, about three or four million ton annually. And demonstration test is scheduled to the begin in 2025. Uh, Super Cost 50 uh, also is uh, currently uh, under the development in the Kimitsu Works. Hydrogen injection operating test is underway in the experimental blast furnace. This photo shows a uh, uh, experimental blast furnace and its uh, inner volume is 12 cubic meter. Uh, the amount of the CO2 emitted by already uh, being reduced to 22%. So this uh, uh, experimental uh, facility is very, very uh, useful. So. We use uh, this one in the course 52. So I show some uh, result. This is scientific result. Look at the light figure. Uh, this figure shows the relationship between the total input hydrogen and carbon consumption uh, reduction. Okay. So uh, we. Uh, uh, blow the normal temperature hydrogen containing gas uh, from uh, two years, only two years. So uh, from the baseline and the green one shows the COG uh, injected and COG plus hydrogen and pure hydrogen. Okay. So as you see, pure hydrogen uh, provides the highest uh, in a carbon saving. Um, and this is because uh, COG, coke oven gas, contains uh, about 30% of the uh, methane, um, <clears throat> which uh, is disadvantageous in terms of the input carbon. Of course, we have to count uh, uh, carbon in the methane and uh, decomposition, heat compensation. So at normal temperature, uh, hydrogen blowing uh, the maximum carbon reduction rate is about 16%. Okay. So that time, uh, uh, operation data in the time is shown in the left figures. This is a more real, real data, actual data. So third row from the top shows the amount of the uh, hydrogen blowing. So around uh, 200 normal cubic meter and close to the 400 cubic meter per uh, unit ton. Okay. So red line shows the temperature of the molten iron. It's a stable. And bottom row shows the uh, percentage of uh, reduction ratio. 
グリーンワンショーザーカーボンダイレクトリダクションレーシオエンドレッドワンショーザーハイドロジェンリダクションレーシオエンドブルーワンショーザーカーボンモノオキサイズダイレクションレーシオ。So with before the hydrogen blowing in the blast furnace, hydrogen reduction ratio is less than 10 percent, and it has increased to about 20 percent, and the carbon direct reduction ratio has decreased accordingly. And carbon monoxide reduction ratio did not change so much. This is a very important point. We did uh, uh, by the operate, operating condition. So uh, without heat compensation, uh, this 16% uh, was uh, maybe uh, the uh, limit to the uh, carbon reduction. So in uh, super cost 50, uh, we have already achieved 22% uh, carbon consumption reduction by uh, injecting the high temperature uh, hydrogen from the two years. I am confident uh, that we will be able to uh, re report to more than 30% uh, carbon reduction in the very near future. Another hydrogen uh, reduction technology is uh, using uh, indirect hydrogen. This technology adapts the methylation uh, of uh, blast furnace gas and carbon neutral uh, methane is injected. This topic is introduced by uh, Dr. Kashiwara JFE this afternoon. We also developed a uh, direct hydrogen reduction technology. But the former uh, presenter uh, <laughs> explained the detail just so we started. Uh, but the important point is uh, 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 target the use of lower grade pellet and 100% hydrogen, they said. Now we are uh, constructing the uh, test furnace in Hataki uh, R&D Center in Nippon Steel. We also develop uh, the carbon recycling technology using uh, methanation in the direction reduction. Uh, this topic is also introduced by uh, Mr. Terui Jehui this afternoon. So when we use uh, direct uh, hydrogen reduction, electrical uh, uh, technologies for the high grade steel making and high uh, productivity is very important. Uh, in this development, uh, we are learning uh, for the four main purposes. Optimization of DRI uh, 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 you know, dissolution rate um, for the productivity and uh, promotion of the deforestalization, right? using improving the agitation and controlling slag and acceleration of denitification by atmosphere control and carbon addition, and optimization of the stirring method. Uh, the targets are 150 ppm or less the phosphorus and 40 ppm or less of nitrogen in the 300 tons large electric furnace by 2030. In this project, uh, New carbon dioxide absorbents uh, have been uh, developed to minimize the CO2 desorption energy for the CCUS. The highly uh, efficient uh, efficiency uh, amine solution uh, developed in the cost 50. Uh, left figures is a so. The CO2 uh, capture energy uh, becomes almost a half uh, comparing, compared with uh, uh, conventional MEA. And this technology uh, was, uh, has already uh, been in put into the uh, practical plants at the two locations, the Hokkaido and the Shikoku area. Specification is shown this. 
Okay. Uh, the finally, uh, I, I will briefly introduce uh, the collaboration with uh, uh, academic societies in Japan. Uh, ISIJ, uh, is the Iron Steel Institute of Japan, established the committee of uh, carbon neutral iron steel making last year, and also established a research grant uh, system to promote uh, exploratory research that it is uh, difficult to, for the private company to undertake. Uh, these are future technologies uh, that cannot be expected uh, to be uh, projected in this stage, but very interesting uh, many ap applications uh, have already uh, received. So 47 uh, projects uh, for the persons have been adopted and 24 projects for the group uh, are going now. This is one example. Uh, Dr. Uh, Takanohashi group is uh, uh, researching the production of the high-strength biocoke uh, in a new way. Uh, future of this technology is uh, pretreatment and a new co-processing with uh, biomass and waste plastics. Uh, another uh, example concerns the uh, CCU. Uh, Professor Tsubouchi group is researching the CCU uh, use uh, the use of the uh, actual uh, exhaust gas from the factory uh, as it is. It means uh, high sulfur and high uh, carbon monoxide and low carbon dioxide. I don't uh, explain the detail here, but including these kind of uh, research topics, we are now planning to uh, hold uh, a symposium in Nara in Japan uh, next uh, December, one year later. So Nara is a very, very beautiful ancient city in Japan. And also we look forward to having uh, uh, Mr. Andrew Paris uh, as a plenary lecture. And uh, we look forward to your uh, uh, participation very much. So this is summary. Um, the Japanese steel industry has been uh, engaging the hydrogen reduction steel making from the earliest uh, stage. And now we will further uh, develop these technologies and work towards the uh, carbon neutrality uh, in a multi track uh, and cooperative manner. As you know, uh, for the carbon neutrality, massive and stable supply of carbon free. Uh, hydrogen and electricity with no rational cost so uh, requires. So well, everyone said relationship among us and with uh, uh, like partnership uh, among us and with other uh, industries and government and academia are necessary. Thank you very much for the attention. Shukran Laka. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to now invite uh, our missing speaker, uh, Dr. Chu. I was missing you. So please. Uh, just wanted to say a word of thanks to our distinguished speakers, I am really pleased that uh, you have done a fantastic job in highlighting the, the strategy that the steel industry has. So we started this morning off with the, the mission and, and vision, and you have paved the way, outlined the strategy, and that is really kind of an appetizer. You have just wet the appetite of everybody, because now we will go after lunch towards the real juicy bits which are the, the concrete actions in all of those areas where the steel industry is trying to, to decarbonize all those pa different pathways. So I am glad that uh, we have got such a distinguished uh, audience here. So please, I would like to just, before you go, give you a little token of appreciation and uh, maybe some pictures.
So we'll now take the break uh, for lunch. So we'll be back in one hour. Thank you very much. When you go outside, you turn right. <laughs>